cassette number 8 from the December Waiting, 1975. Two messages presented in this waiting. First, the knowledge of the holy by Reverend Ronald Hogue, followed by In One Accord by Reverend Lauren Helm. Shall we pray, please? Jesus, we praise thee tonight for thy yes. goodness. Thank you, Jesus. We praise thee for thy mercy. We praise thee, Lord, for you love every soul here tonight. We're unworthy. I'm unworthy. Lord, we yes, thank I you am. for thy precious blood. I'm unworthy. We glorify thee. We magnify thy name. Amen. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. Amen. For God is wonderful. His name is good. And the Bible said his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor of the Mighty God, yes. the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord, that the peace of God rules and reigns within our hearts as we deny ourselves daily and take our cross and follow thee. We love you, Jesus. We praise thee. Lord, I know not how to preach. You're surely going to have to help me to share a few words here with these people. We pray that you would help and anoint, and as Brother Morgan prays, illuminate the word of God, Lord, as we try to share. We praise thee, we thank thee, and we pray that you'd strengthen us and quicken us together, quicken us together in heavenly places. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Let me read just this one scripture, and then you can be seated. Chapter 9, book of Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You may be seated. As I was saying earlier, we went to Parisburg, Virginia on the witness of the Holy Spirit. Not on about what we felt or what we desired, because that's not what we desired. I desired if I had to be in a church. You see, I'm not, I didn't really cherish the thought of being a minister and a pastor in a church. I knew God had called me to preach. The Holy Spirit witnessed on that. And I thought, Jesus, it would surely be wonderful. If I'm going to be in a church to work under some precious man of God that I can learn from, that I can learn knowledge from, that I can receive understanding from, Lord, it would just be wonderful. So I prayed that prayer, and you know, the Lord never granted that prayer. I said, Jesus, I want to do thy will, but this, this would surely be nice, Lord, if I could do this, because it would, it would help me, because I don't know anything. So as we continued to wait upon God in Anderson, Indiana, waited and waited and trusted and had a marvelous time in the factory, Delco Remy, striving to wait upon Jesus and trust him and be true and faithful in the factory. Oh, if we could get the people true and faithful that work in factories Amen. and that work in stores, Amen. those salespersons and those people that work at cashier as a cashier, if we could get all these people that work in these places of business to be true and faithful unto Jesus at all times. I believe the Lord would do a marvelous work in America. If we could get people to deny themselves and wait upon Jesus, the Lord would surely work. He would surely bless his people. So as we waited there in Anderson, word came from heaven one day. Came from heaven, and you know it made my knees weak. And I shook, really. And I prayed the prayer. I said, Jesus, if you ever get me to Parisburg, Virginia, I'll have to start dying from this point and die until I get there and die while I'm there, Lord, because I'll not make it. I'll not make it. I don't know anything. I haven't been taught certain things. I haven't been learned in how to preach the gospel. That is, in a formal way. But you know, when we started our journey toward Parisburg, I had a wonderful feeling in my heart. And we stopped by Scott Depot, West Virginia. I wanted to get the last bit of encouragement I could from my older brother. Because <laughs> I knew he'd been in the business for a while, and 
He'd faced a few hardships and trials, and he seemed to have joy, and I wanted to get close to him before I got down there. Yes, sir. I remember eating in the 17 restaurant. Now, Oliver would try to share with us, and the whole time I was choking up. I could hardly hold the tears back. Because this was a new assignment for me. This was a much different assignment. This was a big, big assignment, too big for me, and I knew it. And as Oliver continued to share, I continued to shed tears. And I was just trying to hang on by faith and say, Lord, I'm trusting, I'm trusting, I'm trusting. Help me, Lord, to die out. Help me, Jesus, to die as I'm on my journey here. Yes. And Oliver said, Ronnie, he said, uh, the Lord's going to be with you. Scott Depot's going to be praying for you. That made me feel good. He said, brother, we're going to pour the prayer on. I said, well, praise God. Oliver, I need it. He said, you know, I was talking with Brother Ham, and, and he didn't have any check on this weekend. He's just free about it. And I, boy, that made me feel real good. Because I felt like Jesus was really in it. That weekend, I was going to try out. And when we got to Parisburg, I'll tell you, friends, a love affair began in my heart. A love affair, a peace came over my soul. When I walked in that church, a, such a peace and a love and a joy thrilled my soul. Yes, yes, amen, amen. Oh, I was so thankful. I was so excited for, for Jesus' help. Okay. Well, here's a little man that doesn't know anything. And he's given him a big assignment, I feel. Wonderful. Precious. I said, Lord, as I've often heard Brother Ham preach, you're going to have to be my teacher. And I heard him preach one time, they shall all be taught of God. Yes, yeah, wonderful. They shall all be taught of God. Think of it. Think of it. Not from men. Not from many formal ways. Those are good sometimes when they're in order, divine order. Yes, sir. But the Bible says they shall all be taught of God. I was challenged some years back by a message that I heard. I don't know whether it was in this room or another waiting, but a precious man of God spoke to us that day, Reverend Carl Roundtree for St. Louis, Missouri. And there's one statement that he made that stirred myself and my brother Terry up so much. He said that most people had rather die than to get up and pray one hour every day. Most people had rather die than to get up and pray for one hour every day. It stirred my heart. It stirred me up. And along with a sermon that I have a copy of, and Terry and I, when we would feel a lack of getting up and waiting upon God, would get this sermon out and play it over and over and over again until God could get the truth in our heart. Wonderful. It was a sermon that Brother Helm preached. I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me, before the land, that I might not destroy it. Yes, sir. God's searching for men and women that will deny themselves and wait upon Jesus and stand in the gap. Yes, sir. Not to seek so much or to know so much or to be so much. The Bible said the knowledge of the holy his understanding. They shall all be taught of God. I found out as I waited upon Jesus, and I'm finding out every day I know so little about it, but I'm striving to wait more and wait more and trying and striving to make sure that I don't deny myself and that my heart is cleansed and purified daily as I try to come before the throne of grace and wait upon Jesus and get in a place of prayer and listen to the Savior and praise the Savior that I might know a little bit about the knowledge of the Holy. How do we get to know Jesus? How do we get to know God? One way we get to know God is through Jesus. 
as we're converted. But you see, conversion brings us to God. Conversion brings us to God, and it brings us to the place to where we can wait upon God and begin to know God a little bit. Yeah. Begin to see his face, begin to see his loveliness, begin to see his holiness, begin to see his purity, begin to see what the blood of Jesus is all about. Oh, Conversion yeah. brings us to God. Praise yeah. Jesus. That we might learn and wait upon him. Yeah. Learn how to trust him. Yeah. Learn a little bit about God. Oh, if we could get people to read Brother Ham's book, a chapter on waiting on God, it'd do us all good. Yes, See, I've tried to urge our people, unless we would read Brother Ham's book ten times, we'll not get the central message in this book. Unless we'll read it at least ten times, I believe the Holy Spirit's witnessed on that. Yes, sir. Then we'll not really know what this book is all about and what God really wants us to hear and wants us to see and find out in this book. Now, they're striving on that, and I'm trusting they'll go home and continue to read. And the rest of us. You see, the Lord's revealed it. Well, why can't we obey it? It's because we don't want to deny ourselves. It's because self wins out. We're self-assertive. We don't want to obey the leading. You see, we're going to have to learn to obey men of God. We're going to have to learn to obey the man of God, as we heard this morning. That's been my heart's desire, really, to obey Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ. Amen. But you know how I've learned to obey Jesus? As I've try, tried and have been striving, learn, learning how to obey what God speaks through Brother Ham. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. How do we get to know our wives? How do we get to know our wives? First of all, we spend a lot of time with them. If you love your wife, you want to spend a lot of time with your wife. Yes, sir. I'll tell you, you want to be with her. Amen. And when you're not with her, you're just a little bit lonely in your heart. You think, well, it'd sure be nice if I could have my wife with me. Yes, sir. It would sure be nice. Oh, indeed. And you know, when I, was first, when I was first married, I thought I knew my wife pretty well. I thought I knew her. I thought. Yes, sir. I believed that I knew my wife. I was with her. I saw all these surface things. I saw these things on the outside. Many times I saw uh, things that she did and things that she appreciated. I learned just a few things about my wife. I thought I knew her pretty good. I'm not an old-timer in marriage, but I've been married eight years. But you know, I found out that I didn't know my wife too well. I'm finding out every day that I learn new things about my wife. I'm finding out, Brother Ham, that my li wife likes a few things like you spoke about this morning. She likes a little flower now and then. May Jesus help me to be true and faithful. I'm finding out, Brother Ham, that she likes to go in a place, and I've heard you preach it, and it's helped me so much. It's helped my marriage for you to preach. It's helped my marriage tremendously for Brother Ham to preach. He said, uh, dear ones, don't think it foolish if your wife wants to go in and look at trinkets. No, go in with her. Go in her. with her. Help her. And help her and love her. Yes. Let her look at a few things. It'll help her. Oh, yes. They enjoy you it. You see, that's helped my marriage. Yes, sir. Oh, it's helped my marriage. Our marriage has been so enriched. Yes, sir. Through Brother Helm's life and through Brother Helm's ministry. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. The Bible says we will not know God unless we spend time with him. We think we know him pretty good when we're first saved. We think we know Jesus pretty well. I tell you, we're thrilled about the Savior. We have a right to be. We're thrilled about him, and we think we know God pretty well. But unless we'll wait upon Jesus, unless we'll spend time with the Savior, we'll never get to know Jesus, who he is. Oh, Jesus, that's true. Oh, I pray the Lord will help you and challenge you, along with myself, to spend time in prayer waiting upon God. Praise the Lord. 
We'll have to deny self to do it. Yeah. The devil doesn't like for you to wait upon God. You see, when you wait upon God, you begin to look into the face of Jesus. Yeah. You begin to look in the face of the Son of God. And he looks down upon you. And you begin to see the loveliness of his face. You begin to see the purity and the holiness of God. And you begin to see the awfulness and the sinfulness of man's heart. You begin to see the hellishness of man. Yes. And it makes you want to get on your face and many times does drive you to your face. Yes, sir. In despair, crying out, Oh God, have mercy upon me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Jesus. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Help me, O oh God, and cleanse my soul today. Purify my heart and wash me and cleanse me That's whiter me. than snow. That's just me. I'll tell you, I have to pray it every day. Oh, wonderful. I have to get before the Lord Jesus mm. and tell him I'm sorry. I love him. I love him. I love him. Amen. I praise him. I praise him. I praise him. I worship him. I glorify the lovely Christ. Oh, that's praise. I'll tell you to spend time with Jesus. You get to know Jesus, who he is. Oh, I believe it. You find out who the Savior is. Oh. You find out who, just who saved you. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank the Lord. Wonderful. Praise his holy name. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. So thank as you Jesus. spend time with God, you get to know him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's wonderful to know him. It's wonderful to wait upon him. It's wonderful to praise him. Amen. You know, I read books about men of prayer, and it challenges my heart. It really ch it stirs me up. I hear about Brother Him praying, I want to get somewhere and pray. Well, I heard him tell one time about how he'd get in a bathroom and pray. Oh, yeah. He'd sit, he'd get in there and pray. He'd pray loudly when, he, when his voice was real good. And yeah. He'd get in there and just pray and pray and pray. And he'd wait on God a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I thought, well, time. I'll tell you, if that helps him to walk with God, then I'm going to do it too, the Lord help him. my heart. I'm going to do it too, the Lord help him. Oh, yes, sir. So when I was in Anderson, Indiana, but God's grace would begin to get up. I'll tell you, just across the road was another man that was getting up. Had been getting up for some time. So we'd get in there and put on one of the tapes, Brother Helms' tapes, Glory. and begin to listen to it. I was sitting there in the dark. We lived in a little apartment. It wasn't too big, and I couldn't turn the lights on. I'd wake up my wife and my baby, my wife and my baby. Yes. So I'd sit at the kitchen table, put my earphones on, turn the tape on, get me a sermon out on self-denial, <laughs> listen to it, maybe for 45 minutes or an hour. Sit there and plead the blood and say, Oh, Jesus, put this in my heart. It's worked for this man. It'll work for all of us. Oh, God, help me to hear it. Oh, God. Lord, help me to hear it. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood. Sit there and get sleepy. I have to resist the devil. Take myself loose from hell. Say, Oh, God, help me. Oh, that's in my heart. I'm going to fail unless you help me today. Oh, true, true. I'll tell you, put that on there, and first thing you know, get blessed. Oh, boy, I get blessed. Get blessed now. and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I get blessed. I'm glad I got up and waited now, Lord. Oh. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Amen. So after we listened to a tape for maybe 45 minutes or an hour, I'd go in the bathroom, and I thought of Brother Ham. I said, Lord, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. It was about the only place I had to pray in that little apartment. And I would get in the restroom, and I couldn't be loud because it was so small. So I would get in there, and I'd walk. It would just have enough room just to walk a little bit. Just a little bit. And I'd get my hands in the air and begin to praise the Lord quietly. <laughs> I wasn't as loud as I am today. Don't get up at home with your wife sleeping. Yeah, Try to yeah. praise the Lord real loud because it'd wake her up. Yes, sir. I'll tell you, you can get in there. And by God's grace, to get in the restroom, I begin to say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory Sometimes I get so excited, I start getting a little loud. Say, Lord, help me now. <laughs> so I try to praise the Lord for about 20 minutes that way. Then I get on my knees, try to get quiet myself. Bend over the old commode. 
some mornings, those of you that have prayed very much, you find you get sleepy sometimes. Yes, Early sir. hours of the morning. Keep moving. Many times I get sleepy and I have to bang myself around a little bit to try to stay awake. But you know, a marvelous thing happened one morning. Marvelous thing. It's worth all my years of waiting. <laughs> worth all my years. One revelation is worth all the years of waiting, my friends. Oh, yeah. So as I was there on my knees waiting on God, I saw my wife falling downstairs. Somehow I just saw it. I don't know how. I tell you, it shut me up. I said, oh, God, in the name of Jesus, spare her today. Be with her. Help her, help her, help her, help her protect Lord, her, intervene, up, deliver, Lord, undertake. Oh, Lord, get your arms around her somehow, protect her. Amen. Take of it what God revealed to me in prayer, to his glory. Yes, sir. With all the years of waiting upon God. Yes, sir. There she was, carrying a child. Well, I went on to work and forgotten about it. Somewhat. When I got home, Peggy said, you know what happened to me today? I said, what? I thought I knew what was coming. She said, I was with Jane McIntosh today at Warner Press and was walking down steps. And you know, she said, I slipped and fell. Jane was there to help me. Protected. God protected Yes. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I said, honey, I want to tell you something. This morning I was in prayer. And the Lord revealed to me that you were going to fall down steps. And I prayed, oh, God, in the name of Jesus, protect her. Say, well, that's a little thing. No, it's not. No, it's a big thing. That's not very little. That's pretty big to me. Yes, sir. And that's pretty big to Jesus. Yes, sir. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Yes, sir. Then when I got to Parisburg, if you're a pastor, you'll know what I'm talking about. People come to you and say, Brother Hogue, what should I do? Brother Hogue, what should I do? Brother Hogue doesn't know. And I've received very few answers since I've been there. I'm sure thankful for those that God has given. They came to me one day and said, Brother Hogue, what, we should, what should we do for a youth leader? What should we do for a youth leader? They didn't have a youth leader. The one they had resigned, very precious lady. I said, well, let's just wait and trust Jesus. Let's just wait and trust the Lord. A month went by, two months went by. They said, Brother Ho, what, what can we do? I said, let's keep trusting. Amen. Three months, four months. Brother Ho, what can we do? What about a youth leader, Brother Hope? What should we do? He said, I don't know. Let's just keep waiting. Let's keep trusting Jesus. He knows. He holds a plan in his hand. Yes. If he wants to let us know, he'll tell us. So we kept waiting upon Jesus. When I went there, they had a youth program. But you know, very few of the young people were converted. I don't really know of one that was soundly converted when I got there. And I mean soundly converted. But think of it, the Lord stopped the programs. And they kept coming to me. People kept coming to me and said, Brother Hope, what should we do? You see, if we give a wrong answer, we're going to be responsible for it in judgment. Yes, sir. God help. So we need to wait upon God. We need a knowledge that's of the holy. That's serious. We need to know what Jesus wants. So we continued to wait and wait and wait. Well, about three or four months, the young people were sitting in the back of the church. And I believe Ruth Ann Bradley was the first one to make a break. Came to the altar and Jesus saved her real good in a marvelous way. Praise God. And then Kay moved forward. She came to the altar and God saved her. And they began to come. God began to say they began to move from the back seat up to the front seat. It's been a year now, and we don't have a youth director. We don't have a youth program, but we have a saved youth group. Oh, we're in debt to Jesus. Want to praise the Lord for that. Want to praise his name for that. 
God saved them. He's redeemed them. He's cleansed them by the blood. We praise his name. The Bible said a knowledge of the holy is understanding. We must wait upon God. Let Jesus have his way. Amen. How else can we know? How else can we know God? Well, you know, if I were to take a trip somewhere and someone wanted to know Pastor Hogue, what he was like, the best person they could go to would be my wife. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I should say. They really want to know what I was like. The best person they could go to would be to go to my wife. Why, indeed. Absolutely. So they could go to her. Mm-hmm. Say, what about your husband? What kind of a man is he? I could sure find out. She'll know pretty well. Indeed. How's that done? It's done by observation. It's done by observation. We gain a knowledge of the holy yes. by observation. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you know that I've gained a knowledge of the holy by an observation of a man that walks with God? Yes. To the glory of Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus our Lord. To watch his life. To try to follow him as he follows Jesus. We know God by observation of those that are filled with God. Gracious Jesus. The knowledge of the holy in the Bible said it is understanding. So as we watch them. You know, when I worked in a men's clothing store, I desired to be a good salesman. Oh, I desired it. I love fine clothes. I've sold clothes for many years. What would I do? How did I know how to sell clothes? I had one of the finest men's clothing salesmen at Crossfit, Arkansas. I believe in the whole state of Arkansas. A man that loved people. A man that when a person would walk in the front door could call that person's first name. So what do you think Ronnie Hogue tried to do? He tried to observe what that man was doing. Oh, yeah, indeed. He tried to observe. And when the people would come in, I'd try to sneak around and find out what their first name was. (laughs) Try to memorize their name. I'd watch him. He'd go over and take a suit of clothes off the rack. And he'd put on his man's, he'd, he would put it, slip it on a man's back. Fine suit of clothes. He was so kind. He was so courteous. He was so thoughtful. Beautiful. He was loving. Beautiful. He wanted to dress people up. He desired that people look nice. How did I get to know how to sell clothes? As I observed. As I watched the man. I get to know God as I watch a man that's oh, filled with God. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. We're dead to thee, Jesus. People, let's keep our eyes. Let's keep our eyes upon the man of God. Observe him. As he walks, observe how he walks. I do, by God's grace. As he looks at you, observe how he looks at you. Yes, sir. As when he's at a table, observe how he eats. When he puts his wife's Coat on, observe how he does it. When he opens the car door, observe him. When he speaks, observe him. Don't take your eyes off of him if you can help. We can gain a knowledge of God that way. Jesus. Because the Bible said that it's Christ within you, the hope of glory. It's Christ within you and within me. That is the hope of glory. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. And to observe that in a person's life, I'll tell you, it'll encourage your heart. You know what I told Brother Ham? My father. When he called me and talked with me on the phone, I'm always thrilled when he calls. Brother Ham, just call whenever the Lord will let you. It helps me so much. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, I love to hear your voice. And when you talk, it encourages me, it lifts me, it strengthens me, it gives me new encouragement. Oh, I'm so glad. So I shared with Brother Ham. I said, Brother Ham, 
You know, I heard my daddy say one time, to have a person share about what God's done for him, how the Lord has led, how Jesus has helped, how the Lord's healed someone. He said, you know, that, that really encourages me. That really lifts me. So I shared with Brother Him. I said, Brother Him, keep obeying Jesus. Keep obeying God. Keep walking with the Lord because it's helping me. Amen. As I observe your life, as you share with me, praise God, it helps me. Glory. Please keep Amen. obeying the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, grant. Oh, it's helping me. Yeah. It's helping me at Parisburg Church of God. I've shared with my people. I said, people, you know why we're experiencing all this? Do you know why we're experiencing the blessings of God? Do you know why God is healing so many people here? Do you know why the kingdom of God's in such working so wonderfully in this church? It's because one day a young man came home and knocked on the door. He said, "Honey, I've come home to go with God. <laughs> That's the reason we're experiencing the marvelous work of Jesus. It's we're in debt to thee, Jesus. To God's glory and to God's praise. Oh, we're in debt to thee, Jesus. Because one person denied himself and obeyed the Holy Spirit consistently. Let's observe that person. Let's observe Jesus Christ living within him, the hope of glory. The Lord will teach you. I shared with Brother Ham. I began to pray about speaking on a Wednesday night on the knowledge of the Holy, and the Lord began to show me these things. And I thought, you know, there's more in this verse than what I see. I've heard it all my life, but there's more in it. There's more in it. I've got to find out. And the Lord had already revealed some of these things I've shared with you in prayer. He revealed them to me as I was waiting upon him, trying to gain a knowledge of the holy. I said, Lord, there's a, there's a meaning behind these words. So I went to my library and I pulled out a book on New Testament words. So I want to look these words up. Just find out what they do mean. So I looked up the word knowledge, and I want to share this with you. There are three words in the Greek which describe knowledge. The first one is sophia. This is wisdom of ultimate things. It's wisdom of God. This is the knowledge of the holy. The second word is phronesis. This word is usually translated as prudence. The basic difference between Sophia and Phronesis is that Sophia is theoretical and Phronesis is practical. Sophia has to do with thought and Phronesis has to do with our life and our conduct. The third word is Sunesis. This means a uniting, a union, a bringing together. It would be true to say that synesis is the faculty of putting two and two together. Well, you take these three Greek words and you put them in this marvelous scripture. The knowledge of the holy is understanding, and you come up with a beautiful thing. The knowledge of the holy is Sophia. Sophia is the other two Greek meanings here. Sophia is the theoretical. 
Phronesis and synesis is the practical. So when you gain a knowledge of the holy, when you wait upon God, when you observe a person's life, when you get to know God, when you spend time with God, when you walk with God, you get to know God as you walk with God. As you deny yourself and obey the Holy Spirit, you get to know God. Yes, indeed. And this gives you a knowledge of the holy. This gives you a Sophia. And then this Sophia is a practical thing. It's putting two and two together. It's a knowledge, the Bible says the knowledge of God, you know, so many times people will say, well, I don't see much need in getting to know God. It doesn't do you any good. The Bible said the knowledge of the Holy is. To know God is. To know God is knowing how to do things, how to help people, how to love people. Amen. Yeah. It is. As you wait upon God, as we deny ourselves, as we take our cross daily, the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. God does teach you how to do this, how to put two and two together, how to move here, how to proceed there. Amen. How to do His will. He, does, he just doesn't teach you a bunch of theoretical things and leave it there. He just doesn't show you the beauty and the loveliness of Christ's face without teaching you how Amen. to bring things into perspective. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. I trust that we'll wait upon Jesus. Get to know him. Find out who he is. That we might know how to apply and to love our brothers. Amen. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for the insights of thy sacred word and truth to reveal to us as we maintain the vision. For thee said, where there is no vision, the people perish. And with the vision, thee enlightens and brings to us by thy word the knowledge of God in prayer and waiting truly by observation and application and consistent obedience. The opens the eyes and the scales fall away. The scales <clears throat> of selfishness, the scale of the carnal desire fall away and thee lets us read in the book of knowledge and between the lines of truth, and you bring us to wonderful things in revelation of that precious word which our brother has brought so precious and beautiful to our attention. We would beseech thee tonight that each of us would make our calling and election sure that we will not come short of thy purpose and thy will, and that we, everyone here, may seek Jesus earnestly and with all the heart, dear Father. For we know the time is short, and the coming of Jesus is soon. And they said in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, that the number was quite few. That and few there be that find us alive. So we pray, Lord, that we will not delay any longer, but hasten every person out of victory, every person that does not know the joy of the Lord and the peace of the Christ, that they shall make their way to an order prayer and pray and yield. And if we know thee as Lord and as Savior who has forgiven us, that we shall pursue thee with all the might, and with all energy and with all enthusiasm, with all earnestness, in order that the entire heart and life may be truly and entirely completely sanctified, that we will be cleansed by the Spirit of God, the blood of Jesus, that we may be fit vessels, sanctified and meet for the Master's use, that they can indwell our hearts and our lives to be true to thee and resist Satan and all the things that would keep us in lukewarmness and coldness and disobedience and skepticism. We pray tonight for the kingdom of God to be in operation. Amen. Let us stand.
a message preached by Reverend Lauren Helm entitled, In One Accord, delivered Monday evening, December 29, 1975. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord. Second chapter of the book of the Acts, verse 1. They were all with one accord. They were all with one accord. One accordness is seeing alike, being alike, walking alike, hearing, loving, embracing the same faith without conflict, without controversy, and without carnal uprisings. Being of one accord is where the entire group is together, and Jesus is the head of that body in full control of it, full preeminence, having complete domination of that body. And it is God's will that Christ's body be one. And when the body is one, it's just as a result there is one accordness, always togetherness. To be in one accord means we're in perfect harmony. We're not, we're not out of order on the scale, out of the line or the space. We're completely within that area on this beautiful symphony and melody of space. And uh, we're not flat, but we're on uh, pitch, dead center tone quality, one accord. In one accordness, there is not any flats, no sharps. It is completely in holy harmony, in a lively tone, a beauty of love and light and grace and life. When I stood up to speak concerning one accordness, it is such an immense subject and territory that only God can give anyone guidance and wisdom and understanding about what one accord is, but it is a beautiful experience to know. This has been God's will for his church <clears throat> on all ages, that the church and the body of it be absolutely of one accord. And he said here on this account that on this particular day of the Feast of Harvest, when it was full to come, they were all present, one in spirit, one accord. There was oneness in the mind and the heart. Their thoughts were together. They were dead centered on Christ. Their hearts were on the risen Lord. On his word, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. They were together on it. They had waited 10 days. It required time, God's time, God's place. For Jesus said in the city of Jerusalem. He didn't say in Bethany. Some tell us that they think that he ascended uh, near the Mount of Olives, near Bethany. Others have other ideas. But he said, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. And there they waited, and they waited, and were refined and cleansed. For this time, they were wanting to sit on the right hand and the left hand. Before this time, they were wanting to call fire down if everything wasn't just the way they felt it should be. But that's no longer the case after 10 days in the upper room. They had put aside all selfish desires, all selfish incentives, put them away. They were cleansed out of them. They were taken from them. They were surrendered 
their ideas. They surrendered their notions of who should be the greatest in the kingdom, to be willing to be nothing and just wait and be whatever the Lord wanted them to be. And so the, the ultimate and the will of God is that we become one. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And when Jesus' mind is within the believer, and you get two believers with the mind of Christ, they are in one accord, one mind, the Spirit of Christ. But it requires the leading of the Holy Spirit to do this requires the uh, applying of the precious blood of Jesus Christ to our hearts. We're not able to talk ourselves to this place or to work ourselves to this place or to do any particular good works to get there. It is as we surrender and lose our life. This one accordness is where people have lost themselves and given themselves entirely to Jesus. Now, to me, this is marvelous, right here. You see, I'm just giving you what's come to me. I don't have any notes. I'm just trusting. But this group that will be in one accord is a group of people that will lose themselves for Christ. He said, he that will lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. So in order to qualify to be in one accord is to give ourselves away, to lose our life in his hand. And then he brings us into this wonderful holy unity wherein Jesus is exalted and God is first and the Holy Ghost can reign throughout that body and work it and lead it and direct it and reveal God in Christ to that body. And when the day of Pentecost has fully come, they were all, all of them, every one of them, with one accord oneness, unity, togetherness, sweetness. There was no disharmony, chords, of ideas. There was complete togetherness. It was a symphony of love of God in Jesus Christ. He had risen from the dead and they saw him ascend into heaven and he said, I'm coming again. Here they were waiting now let us consider for a while some of the things or ailments or conditions that could hinder or prevent our coming or any group coming to one accord -ness. The first that I would want you to consider is the slightest unbelief, the slightest doubt would hinder it would prevent or hinder or stop our coming together as one. Unbelief is one of the great hindrances. And we have to battle with this because it wants to crowd in. The self-life wants to bring unbelief, give it an attention. We have to resist it all the while. You can't keep the, these whisperings from coming, but you can prevent them from lingering and resist them immediately. Yes. Remember, he will whisper to you many terrible things, horrible things, things that you're so sorry you ever heard, but they'll come to your mind. And it is a trick of Satan, the powers of the air, principalities and powers of the rulers of darkness, this world, spiritual wickedness, high places, to bring all kinds of various thoughts in order to uh, upset you and uh, uh, come in and uh, then accuse you and say, now look at yourself. You had this awful thought when it was just an approach to the mind. It really didn't come in. You didn't want it, but it came. You had to resist it immediately. And the closer you get to Christ, many times the more the enemy will try to hurl terrible things at your thoughts and at your ears. But you resist it. You do not entertain it. And you praise the Lord for the precious blood and the shield of faith by which you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And we must keep constant care of our fortification so that we're fortified when these terrible things come and assail us that we may be victorious in every step of the mile. So unbelief in any heart can be a great hindrance. Another 
And I think one of the major ones is disobedience. To have in our life a disobedience and we haven't repented of it. And no doubt there are many disobediences, many things we have disobeyed. If we're not careful to obey every time, there's one right after the other because the Holy Spirit is endeavoring every once in a while to lead us, to reveal Jesus, to reveal something that he wants us to do. And if we do not do it, then that's a disobedient mark. And if we fail the next thing, that's a disobedient mark. We must repent of all disobedience. Because if there's a slightest little bit of disobedience in the life, it's impossible for a body to come to unity. Disobedience, you see, it must be repented. It must be cleansed out. It must be given over. And disobedience springs out of the self-centered life. Self is what causes disobedience. When self is denied, then obedience is experienced. And we, we cannot come to togetherness in the self-life. Any fraction of self, any interest of self, will prevent and mar and hinder and stop our coming in one accordance. Wrong thoughts. We have to resist them. Some of these things hinder. All these things hinder us, hinder every church body from coming to one unity, togetherness, one accordness. We must be clean and pure in heart. Only the pure in heart can come. Only through the Holy Spirit can we come to this one accord. We have to surrender. And I know it's through the power of God. We can't, we can't talk ourselves here. Just like that scripture, if two of you on earth shall agree as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And I've seen people say, we'll just agree on that. We'll lay our hands on it. We'll agree. Well, we can say it, but it, it takes the Holy Spirit. It requires him to bring two persons. We are, can't decide this. We may want to. We'll try to, but we can't except he lead it. So the, the secret is the leading of the Spirit. But that means persons that have followed the leading before. Do you follow me? It is the persons that have followed the leading before. Then that means obedience. Because if they hadn't obeyed Jesus and went to the city of Jerusalem and said, we'll just have this meeting in Jericho. This is good a place. It's nice. And the oranges grow down here in bananas. And it's... it's Warm in the winter time. Let's just have our meeting in the upper room down in Jericho. It's a good, nice place. Jesus didn't say Jericho. He said Jerusalem, where sometimes it snows. One time on one of our trips, about five, six trips ago, they had 11 inches of snow that fell in Jerusalem. It melted off before we got there. It stalled traffic from... Uh, uh, Tel Aviv, clear to Jerusalem, they could hardly get up that long grade. In fact, they, they didn't, but it melted off before we got there. It was all cleared away. We made it all right. I think it was just a year or so ago that Tina was with a group uh, up uh, on Mount Moriah uh, at the Mosque of Omar, and uh, it began to hail, and it hailed, it hailed ice, little ice stones. Uh, how, how, uh, hold up your hands. Was it about three or four inches? About six inches. Went over your shoes, didn't it? Yes, you got a cold. You, you received a cold out of that in the city of Jerusalem. They could have said, we'd like to have warm weather down Jericho. But the Lord said in the city of Jerusalem, that's where they were to wait. See, they had to mind God. They had to mind what Jesus said. And they tarried not one day, but ten. But we have to obey. We must have his guidance. We must have followed what he said. I think the requisite of coming to one accord is following what he says. Now, this is just old-fashioned preaching. But I believe, I know it'll work. And I'm giving this to you as he's giving it to me. And the Lord says, I am with thee. So that tells me... He's telling me now we're on the trail and what we've told you is the truth. 
So this is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God that we be cleansed, that we be filled with his spirit, his love. And it's God's will that we come as his church, as his church with one accordness. It is urgent. So disobedience prevents us from getting to Jerusalem, keeps us from the city of waiting, prevents us, hinders us, blinds us. We can't see where Jerusalem is. The life of disobedience can't find the spirit of Jerusalem. It couldn't find it. It couldn't feel its way. If it felt every rock along the trail, it never could find it. In fact, the disobedient, if he'd get there and peel the rocks all the way, he couldn't feel whether it was Jerusalem or Jericho. Because he's blind. Disobedience sends us into instantaneous spiritual blindness and deafness. So disobedience, immediately, we cry to God to forgive us of this disobedience, of this failure, of this coming short of what God said for us to do. Obedience is better than sacrifice, hearkening than the fat of rams. But disobedience brings us to spiritual death. How long does it take a, a disobedience to, to bring us to death? Disobedience is sin. And sin and death are closely associated. And the Lord would have us to obey him consistently and continually. But there is the cross and crucifixion that is its requisite. So without inner denial and obedience in the cross, we will not be able not a person would be able to come to this sacred dwelling. And this is all through Jesus, through his leading, through his spirit, through his direction, to hearts that are yielded, willing to give up all and yield themselves so that he can cleanse out of us all the little burrs and stickers and thorns and briars from us. He can't get a group of people with little briars and get them together in oneness. They must be cleansed out, all these little hatred -ness. You see, little hatred gets into the heart, springs in there, and it's just very detrimental. It's a terrible sickness. Dreaded spiritual disease stops life. So this hatred will prevent it. The slightest spirit of anger, hostility, slightest bit of hostility in the heart of a church matter woman will stop us and hinder us. We can't get into one accordance until it's cleansed out of us. It must be cleansed out from us. We're going to be brought to one accordance, and that's through prayer, that's through obedience, that's through faith. It's going to be that we are cleansed of, ho of a hostile spirit. We must be cleansed of a judgmental spirit. That the judgmental spirit has that spirit of analyzation and criticism and finding fault and murmuring, trying to correct people and get everyone the way they want them. And if they aren't, they pass a judgment. You see, any person that says that somebody's not saved, see, that's a dangerous thing. I don't believe, I, Florence, would you please stand? Have I told, ever told you that this person's not saved or that person's not saved or this person's not sanctified? I think you would agree with me that I fear God and I wouldn't want to tell you they're not saved or this is not sanctified or this order. Uh, I fear God. I want to check on that because I believe that if I were to do that... You know, tried to help and encourage the best we could because I know that that's a dangerous spirit. I know it's a dangerous spirit to, to say, well, now, so-and-so doesn't, he's, he's not really a Christian. Uh, for me to say someone is not filled with the Spirit. For instance, if I were to say that someone does not have the Holy Spirit, I have set myself up as a judge, and I have placed myself in a terrible place. In fact, I have made myself a judge, therefore I will be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged. Jesus said in the first verse of the seventh chapter of Matthew, 
and for me or anyone else to have a judgmental spirit is a very dangerous thing as well as the spirit of disobedience because a, a judgmental spirit is frightening it's fearful but the carnality takes it on and doesn't realize that it's danger thanks for standing but I want to check on that and I'm sure that God doesn't want me to do that or anyone else it's a dangerous thing to say well so and so really doesn't have the Holy Spirit I, I think that it's more serious and dangerous than I could tell you. And uh, the Lord has never led me to do that. It's to say, well, this one doesn't have the Holy Spirit. This one doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because, you see, if I were to do that, I would agree with the Holy Spirit. Because I'd make myself a judge. Set up myself as a judge. And think I was somebody. See, a person sets themselves up a job, they think they're somebody's. That's a lot of self. And that kind of a spirit prevents us coming to one accordance. So I must be cleansed from all those things. Can you hear me? Now, this is, sim this is simple, but it is absolute. And uh, if there's the slightest little bit of uh, something in the heart about our brother or our sister that will prevent us from coming to one accordance. The slightest little thing that creeps in the heart about any one of the body, that's why we have to get it out just immediately. We can't let it stay there. God's breathed. It must be resisted. Somebody says, Brother Hill, that's too straight and narrow path. No, it isn't. No, it's that narrow. It's a narrow path. We must be a pure in heart, and a pure heart can't have these things. A pure heart is to resist all these evils and he wants he, he desires us to come to one accordance while I'm preaching here I'm looking into the most wonderful faces here but I can see as I look into our faces that the powers of hell is going to do all it can to keep any and everybody from coming to this place right. and they'll help anyone that works it up to make it appear so right. they'll assist any one group of people that makes it appear so but it's without the witness of the Holy Ghost because whenever God is leading the Holy Spirit witnesses to truth he witnesses to the guidance he witnesses Amen. to the possession Amen. see and that's within my heart now yes, sir. and uh, therefore the Holy Spirit and his witnessing to us by the witness of the Holy Spirit we only know through his guidance how to proceed you and I may go by feasibility reasonableness it looks good, but it may not be what Jesus wants at all. So we must, we must resist all these things that so easily does beset us. And it's God's will that we do not doubt, possess unbelief, or be critical, or murmur, or complain, or find fault, or say certain things, or anything about anyone. Because if we do, uh, we hinder our coming to one accordness and shut ourselves out of the kingdom of God. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous. Now the unrighteous would be then if we have any unrighteousness in us. Any of these things I've talked about. All the things I've talked about is unrighteousness. I've only got to anger and hostility. I didn't get to contention or resentment because that is also uh, evil, you see, and would keep me out of the kingdom of God. It would hinder me and close the door so I could not enter. If I were to allow that to be in my heart, I have to resist it and be cleansed of it. Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters shall enter into the kingdom of God not a fornicator. That means that the unmarried person cannot have an intimate relation. And if one unmarried and a married has an intimate relation, it is a terrible thing. One has committed fornication, the other adultery. And there's the spiritual fornicator and the spiritual adulterer. And he said, 
that fornicator and adulterer cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And this would prevent, see, any kind of fornication would prevent us. You see, and if it's hidden in the heart, it can be hidden in the heart. And when I say that, it hits my heart that this is true. It can be hidden. See, fornication can be hidden from most people, just about everybody. Inner fornication, adultery can be hidden from most people. And yet it's there. As if there's a one little jot or tittle of it, we can't get to one accordance in the body. Whether it be spiritual or physical, it still grieves the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're pressing to try to get to one accordness. So the Lord wants all these little tendencies out of us. Now you take men and boys. Men and boys have to work hard a lot of times to keep out of their, their minds and their hearts a fornication and adultery because girls and women do not dress <coughs> modestly sometimes. And they have a battle at all day, wherever they are at. Is that right? All these men on this platform agree with me, don't they? 100%. And when girls and women don't dress right, you see, that makes a man, if he's not careful, he may, he, his mind will swing right in there before he knows it. He's got to resist it with all his might. Because, you see, girls and women don't know how we're made. You know, if they did, they'd be scared to death. They'd want to be covered well. Because, see, that creates the spirit of adultery and fornication in the hearts of men every time they see something that is not right. And it's a battle. And uh, it's serious. It's more serious than people know. And, the, and the, our enemies know this, so they, they're creating this in the United States in order to fell us and to, to stop the church of God. So it won't come to oneness. See, we have to be so cautious in how we act and talk and dress or we cause temptation where we are. And uh, this is very dangerous and it is an enemy of coming to one accordness. So, you see, if a person were to see another person and have lust in their heart, where well, they've committed it, you see, according to Jesus' words, and he tells me now, I am with thee when I say that. So we have to resist it. And so it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And that's why we, we plead with our people to be careful how we walk and how we're dressed so that we will not instigate and inspire fornication and adultery. And this is what occurs. And so men and boys have got to be constantly on the uplook and say, Lord, help me, O Lord, and deliver me so I'll be pure in heart and will be trustworthy to thee in every way. So we've got to be against all of this. We've got to be all for Jesus and against all sin. He said, the fornicators, idolaters, and adulterers will not enter in to the kingdom of God. The effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves. That means that if we take something that doesn't belong to us. See, if we take any little thing, if you go into a yard and you see the apples there and you haven't had permission, you take it while well, you've just taken something that didn't belong to you. You say, well, it doesn't mean much. Well, it means something. <coughs> say, well, we'll go in here and uh, here we are and they, why well, we'd be welcome to all the apples they have, all the grapes. Yeah, we would, if they had said, you may have them. But if we go in and just say, well, we'll just take them. When I go into a home, they say, you're right at home. You can have anything you want here, anything in the refrigerator, then I'm at home. I can eat an apple if I want to, or I can have some food. But if they haven't told me, you see, well, I'm not to take it until I, they tell me. Anything that you take and it's not given to you, it's like a thief. You've taken it. And if you talk about somebody, well, you have robbed them. You've stolen from them. Taken from their reputation, you see. You've stolen. Every man and woman that's talked about anybody's actually stolen from them. And that we can't enter into the kingdom of God and we can't get to one accordance. So you see that every one of us in the church, and 90 some percent of people in the church talk about people. 
You pastors know that? It's, he says it's awful and he says it's true. Did you know that? 97%. 92%. That's the average in the professed church. That's where they, that's where it witnesses in my heart. Where's Thomas? Emory. Then we're tr we try to get to one accordness. See how serious it is? Oh, it's more serious than that. And I can tell us. I can't tell us how serious it is beyond my words. We just have to be so careful, but rejoicing all the while. See, the more you rejoice when you live a life of self-denial, rejoice and obey, then by God's grace, he lifts you up above these areas. And you don't find fault with people. You just don't look at their faults. You just love them for what they are. and Just love them and you're just kind to them. And you keep your mind on the joys and the victories and the love and the fellowship. And you keep your mind on that. And that's just, or if you, talk, you just talk about that all the time and never run out. You see, the tendency of the carnal nature is to find fault and to murmur and to, and to criticize people. And this is not of Jesus Christ. This is the devil. It's of the demonic power. It's a carnality. It's a carnal trait. And these prevent and hinder us from coming to one accordness. Slightest resentment. See, the slightest little resentment could get in my heart. If, if I weren't on my guard and prayed and died out and give myself to Jesus all the while, he'd try the enemy in the flesh to try to put a resentment in my heart if he could, anywhere he could. It's by God's grace I can make it from now on. And you too. All of us. Yes. Just little resentments. Just little things just fly in there. You know. And we don't many times realize how these get in us. But if we don't pray enough, if we don't obey God, you see, when, when we disobey, those things can just come right in real quickly. But if we obey the Lord, then he's our shield and buckler. If we obey him, then we have the shield. We'll walk in the light. See, in the life of obedience, when Satan sh shoots, he's you're on top of him. You can't get him up there. You don't go through the army. Just go right under like that. The life of obedience, you surmount them. Life of disobedience, you're where they're shot. They just get all around and fly into the heart and the mind. The life of obedience will come by and you have to resist it and don't let them stay. Tell them to get hints by God's grace. Lord, strengthen me. And so, no thieves. We can't, we can't take things. Can't take little wrenches or pocket knives nor washcloths, nor knives or forks or spoons or any other little thing anywhere at any time. Got to take care of all of our responsibilities. Somebody gives us a bill and they didn't charge us enough, we're to talk to them about it and try to pay it and pay it. And take care. If they give you too much money, give it back. Get back. And it says that the thieves will not enter the kingdom of heaven, nor the covetous. That means that if you, or if I get a spirit in my heart that I want this, I want that, and I begin to say, I just, I just must have it. I just covet it. Oh, I just think, oh, I want it. And we covet it to the, well, covetous is a serious thing. And it, he said, the covetous will not enter the kingdom of heaven, and that really burdens me, and God tells me it's the truth. That's right. See, we can covet, we can covet clothes or homes or persons or jobs. Any earthly thing you can covet. Oh, I just want that. I'm going to have it. That's what I want. Oh, I'm going to get it. Spirit of covetous. They that are covenant. And this covetous spirit will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Nor drunkards. Nor revilers. Nor extortioners. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Such were some of you, but ye are washed now, but ye are sanctified. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. Begin to read in verse 9. To come to one accord. So you see, oh, I preached till 11 o'clock. I got a late start. I'm not near through. I guess I'm going to have to quit anyhow. No wonder I'm tired. But this is so serious. It's so serious. So many little things will hinder us from coming to one accordness. An unclean spirit, uncleanness. Unclean in speech or in body or in mind. Unclean in garments. It's an uncleanness, and this refers to the inner life. Lasciviousness, idolatry. That's to put the home or companion or children before obeying God. Well, I'll be there if, if things work out. When Jesus leads, my wife must not be in the way, nor my children. Through these 37 years, we have endeavored by God's grace to put the kingdom of God first. And Martha told me years ago, she said when they were, she was growing up, she knew and Martha and Nancy and Joyce knew that they were not first. Mother was not first. Joyce, did you know that? How old were you when you found that out, do you suppose? Five, six years old or ten? About five years old, you found out that you and mother were not first. How long were we married, honey, when you found that out? Did you find that out before we were married? See, I couldn't put my wife or my sweetheart first. I had to do what Jesus said. And I, by God's grace, can I do it from now on? Yes. See, the, the Christ must be first. I must do what he says, gladly. Not begrudgingly and say, oh, this is awful. I'm having a terrible time. I have to, I can't do what my wife and my children want. <laughs> See, the, the wife and the husband, the child, the home is a, can be an idol. Yeah. It's an idol if it's first, if it's before obeying Jesus, yeah. obeying the Holy Spirit. But if we'll put Christ first, we'll love our companion more and our children more. Then he gives us so much, all oh, the love he just pours through them to us. It's far richer, sweeter, deeper, higher, more marvelous. When he's first, I'll tell you, if he's first and you go and your wife is without you, when you get home, I'll tell you, when you kiss her and when you love her, she'll be so wonderful, you'll say, I never knew you were so precious because you put Christ first. He can make your wife so wonderful to you after 40 years and 50 years, you'll say, how could it ever be? When Christ is first, that's what he'll do for thee. But he, we can't, otherwise it'll be an idol. We'll make our companion, our children, an idol. Uh, idolaters are not going to enter in. He must be first. See, if I have the slightest little bit of idolatry, I can't, I'll, I'll keep the whole body from coming to oneness. Oh, I need a lot of prayer. I hope this isn't discouraging you. Because it is God's will that we come to one accordness, being one in spirit. So it's any kind of idolatry or witchcraft. And we're living in an age now when we have to plead the blood because there's so much of it on TV, in newspapers. In the community, in clubs, in schoolrooms, they're playing with it. And it is a demon thing, demonic, evil, inhabited. Then hatred, that's verse 20 of the fifth chapter of Galatians. Hatred, variance, difference. So many churches, so many places, churches, 
have they have little groups that are divided. They're varied. They're not together. Some of the leaders of churches are not quite together. They don't see things alike. I want to tell you when the blood washes and you give yourself away, you'll, you'll come together when Christ is completely and you see alike. You say, well, Brother Ham, I can't quite believe that, but I'll give you some scripture for it. And I know it's true, even though I know the devil doesn't like it. Now, I beseech you, brethren, that's the church, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, that's the tenth verse of the first chapter of First Corinthians. So I'm not just talking to him a hat. Talking in truth. He said here that we're all, the church of God is to speak the same thing. Amen. Believe the same thing. Right. Speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions, no variants. Absolutely no divisions in, in the church. If we have a board in our church that's a little bit of carnality, we're in trouble. If there's one member with the slightest bit of carnality left in his heart, he's not willing to die out every second, that church is in trouble with God. And with the community. Is that safe to say? Yes, sir. That's serious, isn't it, Brother Schultze? These ministers here on the platform agree with us, and the rest of you ministers likewise. See, this is serious. This is serious. Yes, sir. Oh, I think it's more than we think it is, perhaps. I believe maybe it's more serious than that. Somebody might say, well, Brother Helm, this, you're kind of on the negative note. No, I'm trying to tell us what's keeping the church from getting to the place where we ought to go. I may not be doing a very good presentation of it, but an endeavor, an attempt, feeble attempt. So God wants his church, all his people are one. And spiritual people speak the same thing, and they're not divided, and they're perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, that's just the book. Right here's the word, and I know it's a fact. The Holy Spirit has revealed this to me in the Holy Ghost, and it's in God's word. Is it any wonder we seldom ever come to one accordness? Is it any wonder? A layman, if you knew how pastors' hearts cry when they're dedicated, and they look out and they see the faces of a layman on Sunday morning. Oh, their heart is broken if they have the spirit of discernment. If they have the spirit of discernment, their heart is broken. Can I say this? Over and over. Over and over. And we're trying to see the world saved when the, when the instrument that he's trying to save it through is ineffective and it's rusted and you can't get it work right. It won't operate. Trying to bring life with death. We're trying to bring life with death. Now, it's grant you that the cross is dying and brings us to life, but this is another kind, another parallel. Praise the Lord. Amen. We didn't just come to play. We didn't come just to be here, but we came to worship Jesus Amen. and to become one Amen. by his grace. And so variance, division is not of Jesus. It's of the flesh and the enemy. Emulations, wrath, strife, sedations, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, such like. So many of these things are others that prevent us from coming to one accordness. Now, if all of us, when we're newly converted, and as we get older, if we will obey God always, then we're not going to be the hindrance. We're going to be the helpers of that body to come to one accordness. When you obey the Lord continually, and I want to tell all the new converts to not get discouraged. Because I want to tell you, it's joy unspeakable. It's full of glory, as you already know. But don't get discouraged when you see that uh, it's not always going the way God wants it. Just keep helping and keep loving. Keep praying. Keep on and on. Don't throw the baby out with the dishwater. A lot of societies in the time past, because the church disappointed them, just threw the whole thing overboard. And we can't do that because Jesus died for this body. And he wants us to be a holy people, 
and he wants to bring us to one accordness. So we come there by giving ourselves away to Jesus. By the blood of Jesus purging, cleansing us, by yielding ourselves to him. Well, I've stood just about as long as I can stand. Just about as long as I can stand. And I'm so thankful for the Lord's giving us this time together.